Are you interested in delving deeper into the hemp industry, uh, supply chain, hemp manufacturing, and hemp industrial applications like hemp plastics and textiles? Would you like to gain insights into the carbon credits linked with hemp cultivation? Ryan McFarland, a prominent figure in the hemp industry, is here to share his expertise on all things hemp. During this episode, he will introduce Where is Hemp's white label product catalog, offering a wealth of knowledge about the hemp industry. Get prepared for an enlightening episode that explores the world of hemp. Ryan, this is awesome, man. I know I met you at the Tony Robbins live thing, uh, business master, I should say, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, and this, the industry you're in is very interesting to me because in some ways it's an old, a very old industry and yet a new industry, but I think it's often misunderstood uh, industry as well. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have you come on and maybe explain a little bit about your story. Sure. What sparked you with the idea of doing this? And uh, so how'd you kind of get started with this whole thing? Yeah, well, first, thanks thanks so much for having me on and uh, pleasure pleasure to connect with you at Business Mastery and certainly be here and uh, and, and share some some insights and in, in what we're doing in the hemp industry. It's, it's an exciting industry and, you know, I'd say emerging, um, you know, 2018, uh, the, two, the Farm Bill came out and essentially made hemp federally legal um, when previously it, it wasn't, which allowed for, you know, a lot of cool things to happen. And um, I, I come from, I come from the, the real estate world. So, so jumping from, you know, flipping properties, which is what I was doing previously to, uh, you know, to get into the hemp space was a complete 180 for me and, uh, and having to relearn everything about farming and cultivation and extraction and chemistry and manufacturing and the whole nine. And so it was, uh, definitely, definitely an interesting proponent growing into it, but, um, it was funny because my, my ex business partner that was in the real estate business previously was the one that told me about hemp and Ah. He was kind of the forward thinking, uh, you know, entrepreneur and, you know, really ahead of the trends. And, you know, this was early 2018. And this is kind of just right as hemp became federally legal. And, uh, you know, it was the green rush. I mean, a lot of people were jumping in and, you know, raising a bunch of money and bringing, uh, you know, bringing a lot of excitement to the space. And what what nobody really realized is is, you know, everyone came in thinking that, FDA was going to approve hemp right away, and uh, CBD was going to go in as a as a food application, as a you know as an ingredient like like any other ingredient, and uh, you know we were going to be drinking hemp cokes a year later, and and that never happened, and um, and so you know a lot of people came into the space early early on in 2018 2019, uh, raised a lot of capital, grew a lot of material, and a lot of biomass, a lot of hemp in the ground, the actual the plant. And, uh, and there was a massive oversupply of hemp in 2019. And when that happened, uh, you know, everything came crashing down. Just, you know, it's all, it's all supply and demand, right? And, right. and we saw a, a major oversupply of hemp in 2019. Um, you know, there was no buyers to buy it, certainly not at the levels that, that a lot of these farms grew, grew it at. And so a lot of uh, material went to waste. So, I mean, you got material that was went rotted in the ground. They never harvested it. They had material that was harvested that sat around for literally, you know, two years, three years in some cases. Mm. Um, and, uh, and just never got harvested, but we saw an opportunity when that, when that happened. And, you know, like I said, I come from the, the, the real estate space, primarily the distressed real estate space. We used to buy, uh, you know, around 200 foreclosures a year and fix them up and rent them out and then sell them as uh, as turnkey rental properties and so i was familiar with the distressed asset space and so we saw saw a big opportunity when when this happened you know because this was essentially you know a, a similar space there was distressed assets the asset was hemp um uh, either in its biomass original form or you know some some of the farmers processed it you know one staged to what would be a crude oil um a hemp crude and um and we had a you know an amazing opportunity to to go and buy up a lot of that material in uh, in 2019 and into into 2020 and so so that's what we did we bought up a lot of the a lot of the material um, you know we processed it into crude as stage one and that you know hemp is, is is similar to kind of you know let's let's say oil and other other extracts is to add to you well, the further you process it and the further you refine it uh, the more valuable it gets. And, and so we kind of learned that, okay, you know, we can keep processing this more and more and more and turn it into a distillate or an isolate or even going as far as a Delta eight, which is now, you know, what's really, really moving a lot of the, the hemp industry is the, is the Delta eight side 
of uh, of the industry. And so as time went on, that's what we did. And you know, we we started uh, really not owning anything. We stayed very nimble, and we were able to you know, really, really ride the waves, right? It was a lot of up and downs and, you know, the people that went too big, too fast, you know, couldn't survive and, and couldn't, couldn't pay the bills. And we kind of didn't raise capital, you know, we bootstrapped it in the early days and, and never raised capital. So we didn't have a big uh, debt obligation and, you know, built a, all of our staff. We started with all of our staff in the Philippines, keep costs down and, you know, kind of built that team up. And now we have, you know, 22 people in the Philippines and, Wow. And, um, you know, as time went on, we just, we just, just got more and more involved in, in the, uh, in the actual process. And, um, and now we, you know, we're, we're one of the largest manufacturers of white label hemp products, uh, mostly consumable products in the space. And so, you know, today we own a, you know, 35,000 square foot manufacturing facility. We can store about 700 pallets. We've got, uh, you know, vape production, gummy production. Uh, we do, you know, pre-rolls, blunts, flour. Um, and we just purchased a hundred foot conveyor oven to be able to produce about a hundred tons of baked goods a month. Uh, this is brownies, cookies, brownie bites, single serve, you know, brownies, cookie bites, things like that. And so, so it's exciting times and, you know, there, there's certainly, certainly a lot of demand for, for the products that we're, that we're doing now. And um, yeah, it's, you know, like, like I said, it's an exciting time in the hemp space and lots more to come, um, you know, down the line with, with all the industrial applications as well that come from it. But right now we're, we're primarily, you know, working on the, the cannabinoid side, the, the health and wellness and, um, you know, the, the, the side that, that people, people like the effects of. And so that's, right. that's what we're now. So what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back a couple steps here. So you, you, your first thing is that you're a real estate distressed guy, which I completely understand. That's one of my backgrounds. So it's awesome. But yeah. um, you, how did you, it's interesting you pivoted. So you, you understand distressed assets, which I thought was pretty interesting. So you saw the opportunity, but it's one thing to see an opportunity, then it's to, to take action. So what do you think was different about how you approached these assets than maybe how the people that were currently in the industry were approaching these assets? I mean, similar to the real estate business, right? I mean, so what was happening there? They were they just didn't know what to do with it, or they were like they were selling it a fire. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, what do you think was your your differentiator at that time to really leverage this whole process and get and get yeah. in there on the ground floor, really, right? Which was maybe the second ground floor. I mean, second ground floor, yeah, that's a great. You typically have this overproduct, right? When everything becomes a. Uh, I mean, we saw that happen in the media world where everybody bought all the media companies and all of a sudden they crash. You see that with yeah. all the anytime they deregulate something totally. You, you tend to get this, this explosion, and then at some point there's this this pullback because everybody throws their money at it at the same time. And you guys were smart; you waited for that period where, wow, here's an opportunity. Now we can step in, right? You didn't join yeah. a, in the, that initial surge, right? You waited because you knew better, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. we we, we kind of that's what we did. We sat on the sidelines, and you know, we were uh, we were basically building data in the in the early days and so you know the, the the hemp industry was was an interesting industry we used to spend a ton of money on facebook and google ads to generate leads to generate you know buyers and motivated sellers and things like that and when we got into the hemp industry you couldn't do any of that you know so all the marketing that i knew you know previously we couldn't do so we had to start fresh and and, and be innovative on how okay well how do we market how do we get our name out how do we get clients how do we get customers and so what we did is we went to LinkedIn and LinkedIn was one of the only platforms that was open and allowed for hemp, you know, kind of let's, let's call it not, not necessarily advertising, but we went another route and we started doing data collection. And so we started a LinkedIn group. We built that group to be the largest group for CBD and cannabis uh, that is still today. We have about 35,000 members in our LinkedIn group. And then off the back of that LinkedIn group, uh, we were collecting data and we were basically finding out what people did and we were just connecting. We were, you know, we were matchmaking, uh, you know, a buyer with a seller and, and making a fee. And then, you know, that turned into, okay, well, let's, instead of just making a fee, let's go buy the material and then resell it. Okay. And now let's go buy the material, then process it one, two or three stages, then resell it. And how we did that is we had all the data. So we knew all the labs, you know, that were processing. So we knew the farmers that had it, we knew the labs that were processing it. And then we knew the brands or the white label manufacturers that were buying the processed oil. 
And so we basically, you know, had the supply chain built from scratch and we understood the supply chain really, really, really effectively. And that allowed for us to go and, 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 and start building this model of, you know, start with the buyer first and then build back to it. And I think that's why we succeeded versus a lot of the other people, you know, took the mind state of if we build it, they will come and they never came. <laughs> and so you, really, you basically created the community where they exchanged information. You were leading that. So you learned a lot from the community directly, which right. they tell us all the time in marketing. Now you really want to find your community. Don't, don't, as you said, you know, build it and they will come is wrong. You you say, where are they and go there, right? If you want to buy something, you go to the mall, right? You go to, you go right. to where the stuff is and you created the place where everybody's going to come in and have a conversation and, and learn, especially when you're in a, at a time of crisis, they're going to, they want to talk to each other. They want to learn, Hey, what are you doing? What do you, what, what's working now? How do I get out of this? Or how do I get, make this better? And so you got a lot of knowledge from that, which is awesome. Um, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Master Your Finances. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. And I'm here with Ryan McFarland. And we're uh, talking about the hemp industry, which great, great transition. When you you knew a lot about buying distressed assets, you, you created a community where they were discussing these assets that you knew were kind of going into distress based on where the market was headed. And now it's up to 35,000 people. You learned it got a lot of data, a lot of information from those people by talking to them and being really, uh, you know, the one that uh, advocated for the communication among, in, that, in that community, which is awesome, which is a great way for any of us as business owners to really uh, learn about our own business and, and, the, and the people that we serve. So the, end, the hemp industry itself, as you pointed out in 2000, it just became legal in 2018. What, what do you think the difference was before 2018 and after 2018 when it became legal? Because this is one of these things that's very controversial do so you want to clarify maybe what hemp is, what it's not, how it's used, and maybe how you know what's going on in the industry now, and and some of the different products that might be out there that have been created since the 2018, maybe things that were all maybe there before 2018. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So you know, hemp is is you know under the 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 cannabis you know is 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 really the mother plant, right? So you have cannabis, which is the you know the, the mother plant, and hemp is really just a set of genetics. Um, that's different from marijuana, right? And so marijuana is the is the set of genetics that gets you, you know, has a psychoactive component, gets you high. Um, and we all, you know, know marijuana most likely. Uh, and, and marijuana is off the cannabis plant. And it's just a set of genetics that has high THC um, and, you know, kind of lower CBD in it. Um, tons of other cannabinoids in, inside of the plant, but that's the main genetic is, is a high THC Delta 9. Hemp, on the other hand, is on the other side, and it's just a different set of genetics. The plant looks the same. It smells the same. You know, you, you can barely tell the difference, but the only difference is that when you test it, the hemp genetic has a low THC. And what makes hemp legal is that when you harvest it, it's under 0.3% Delta 9 THC. And so it has a low THC, but has a very high CBD. And so when you extract the hemp plant, uh, you get a CBD oil off of that. And that CBD oil can be used to make a variety of different products, everything from tinctures that you can put under your tongue to uh, roll-ons, to creams, to edibles, to you know chapsticks. I mean, literally to an ingredient in water. Uh, you know, So you can utilize it for many different product applications, even cosmetics. Uh, are using CBD in 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 their products, and you know CBD is good for you know anxiety. It's good for depression. Uh, it helps with PTSD symptoms. It helps with opioid addictions. And you know these aren't claims. So so and I'm not a I'm not a doctor, and these haven't been approved by the FDA. But but uh, this is what you know actual users of CBD have said. Um, treating epilepsy, it helps with uh, inflammation, diabetic complications. So just tons and tons and tons of, of benefits from CBD. And as time has gone on and with chemistry, they, you know, they've figured out ways to extract various portions of the hemp plant. And so you know, a big portion of the business today is called Delta-8. And so, so like I mentioned, marijuana is Delta-9. Well, you can get Delta-8 from hemp. And, uh, and Delta-8 still has some psychoactive components, just not as strong as Delta-9. And that's a very, very, very big product segment and category 
uh, in the hemp space now is products that are utilizing Delta-8, which still have a psychoactive component. They still give you relaxing. You know, you get a you know little high from it, not as high as you do with regular marijuana, but you still get those relaxing components. And so you're seeing Delta-8 seltzers now, um, drinks that you can buy and, you know, you can buy four packs and, you know, slowly but surely get a buzz uh, in, in a relaxing, you know, type of, uh, type of uh, mood. And then you have um, vapes that you can smoke that have Delta-8. You have uh, gummies that you can eat and get a relaxation from it. Um, you know, going through to baked goods, you can do brownies and cookies and things like this that people are, are producing. Um, all the way through to even like a joint, you know, that's a that's a hemp joint. That's a Delta-8 joint. It's going to give you those same, those same benefits. So lots of different products and, you know, innovation that's happening in the space right now uh, with this, with this category. And, um, uh, you know, it's an exciting time to be around and, and kind of watch, watch, you know, these different entrepreneurs, investors, and business owners, you know, get innovative with, with a lot of these different products that they're, uh, that they're producing. And so that's what we, uh, we do too, is we, we, you know, we manufacture a lot of those products in house and we, we sell those off to, to brands that want to give those to their customers. Yeah, I guess two things I want to, my understanding, maybe you can clarify this for us, is it like the FDA like looks at certain, um, I guess, products that are for wellness and one is like the FDA approved, but then there's like another category where, okay, we don't, we found that this is not, this should not hurt you, right? Be careful, but as far as we can tell, it, it, like there's two levels of approval, right? Is it, um, is it in one of those levels where like, hey, we're putting this information out, we, as far as we can tell, the CBD oil is not harming people, right? So we feel it's like okay to sell it. Is that kind of what the fact category fits? Because I know that you see all kinds of products out there, you know, not FDA approved, but you know, it shouldn't hurt you. It's okay to sell it, right? Is that yeah? So um, FDA still hasn't made any clear, definitive, uh, you know, approved or cleared or not approved and cleared. Okay, so okay. Uh, it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't ruled one way or another. It's basically in the you know still gathering information phase. Okay. Um, you know, a, a lot of like the, uh, supplements and things like that right. haven't been FDA approved, but they're allowed to be sold. And so that's right. probably the difference, you know, but FDA, as far as CBD and hemp is concerned, they still haven't made any final ruling on, okay. uh, on CBD, um, and it's, you know, health benefits have, or risk. Have there been any studies done that you're aware of that, that have studied the, the use of these products? I mean, maybe it's not through the FDA level, but there any... Yeah, uh, you know, any there's, there's organizations gone out that aren't necessarily directly related to the industry that maybe third party. I mean, you can have the industry do your own analysis. That doesn't usually work so good as right. far as the third party. But if you have third parties coming in and saying, hey, we've tested this and so far we found what, you know, what do you, what are they saying out there as far as what some of these organizations? Yeah. Are? So a lot of the third parties, I don't have any studies to reference offhand, but um, there's been tons and tons of studies and research done dating back, you know, uh, decades. Uh, Israel started with a lot of studies and I think they're probably the leading, uh, you know, the leading medicinal research uh, groups out of Israel have, have put together various studies for CBD and found, you know, a lot of the benefits that I had mentioned earlier are actually benefits and, uh, you know, have, have found very, very little adverse effects as it relates to CBD and, uh, you know, the applications for CBD. Um, you know, there's also been studies done at various universities here in the U.S. Uh, that, you know, have found the same thing. Um, you know, and you could uh, Google various studies that have been done and, and, and probably find them pretty easily. I don't have any, again, to, to reference okay. offhand, but certainly there's been studies that companies have done, universities have done, and doctors have done, um, you know, not only here in the U.S., but worldwide uh, with this plant, which is, which is pretty cool. Now, um, are, there, are there other parts of the world where maybe they've, they've legalized this further than we have or approved it through their, their equivalent of our, medic, our ADA? Are you, are you aware of any other countries that maybe are ahead of us in this process, um, anything along those lines or, um, cause sometimes yeah, we, we tend to be European, a little slow <laughs> to some of these yeah, things. I mean, the U S is, is very slow. I mean, we're, we're definitely behind the eight ball. <laughs> so, right. uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's been other, other, uh, like the European commission, um, considers that CBD qualifies as a novel food. And so the EU right. has, has something called novel foods and you can apply, uh, in, in the EU and Europe to have your CBD, uh, as an application into novel foods. And so there's, you know, certain foods that are considered novel, um, over there. And so you can pass and get your, get CBD and foods over there. 
Uh, various other countries have various other rules. I'd say that's probably the largest, the largest one with the largest set of population right. um, that controls it. And that you know the the novel foods is is a you know something similar to FDA, uh, but specifically in the food sector, um, not necessarily in the drug sector. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean you know we're uh, we were hoping FDA was going to rule on it you know quite a long time ago and just still still waiting. So you know. Now, um, are different states taking a position on this? Does that matter? I mean, I know the marijuana thing, you had this, like the federal government has one position, but a lot of the states have a completely opposite position. And how does that kind yeah. of affect your industry as far as the state federal relationship? Yeah, so it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very confusing, right? And it makes it makes it hard for operators to be able to work because every state does have a different position. For example, like California came out with a bill AB 45, um, you know, which allows for hemp to go into certain, you know, certain foods and cosmetics. Um, and it's allowing it to do that. But federally, it's still, you know, still kind of, oh, federally is legal, but the FDA still hasn't approved it. And so, right. uh, you know, so it makes it very, just very confusing on where you can grow, where you can manufacture, can you move it across state lines and things like that, right? Because hemp is legal, though, you know, typically there's, there's no issue moving hemp across state lines. Um, it's just when you get into more of the, uh, the other applications and the other, uh, cannabinoids that hemp has inside of it, for instance, the Delta eight side, um, it's federally legal, but there is some States that have taken the position that Delta eight is not legal. Uh, I think there's 23 States right now that Delta eight is not legal. Uh, primarily those are the States that are, uh, have some sort of recreational, um, or medical marijuana program in place, uh, primarily the ones that are, have a recreational program in place, because the Delta Eight sales are are really starting to hurt the sales of, med of 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 recreational marijuana, which has a tax associated with it, and you know you can only buy it in a dispensary, whereas the Delta Eight products doesn't have a tax associated with it, and you can buy it anywhere, um, and so that's that's you know cutting into a lot of the uh, a lot of the tax revenues that the states are getting that have the recreational program in place. That, that's very uh, interesting, actually. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to take another quick break here. I'm mean, listening to Master Your Finances. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances, and I'm here with uh, Ryan McFarland, and we're uh, you know talking about the hemp industry and how you do have some differential things between state and federal level, uh, which is kind of fascinating. So you know, eventually they'll probably reconcile that as as the governments start to figure out how they want to handle all this stuff. So. Right. Um, you mentioned one thing you kept referring to the white label, right? Um, and one of the reasons you, 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 I guess you're so big now is you do a lot of white labeling and you want to explain a little bit how that industry works and, uh, how that benefits you as well as the people that are, I guess they hire you for the white labeling aspect. And how, how does that whole thing work? I come to you and I say, I'm interested in doing a product. You'd say, okay, I mean, what happens next? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So better. we, um, that, that's exactly how it works is we work with a lot of, uh, existing brands, national brands that are, you know, selling these products, um, you know, they typically uh, have an idea of what they want to do. They come to us and then we help them formulate that idea. So we have, you know, some, some, some brands we help uh, soup to nuts. We help with uh, full, full brand deployment. So we have, you know, in-house graphic designers, we have packaging uh, partners, we have hardware partners, and uh, we, we, we go from concept to finished good and, and then also ship out on behalf of our clients. So, you know, clients will come to us that, you know, have an idea or might have a celebrity behind them, have a big following, you know, have some sort of distribution channel that they can tap into uh, or have existing sales and an existing brand in the space. And they'll come to us and, and, uh, and, and we'll basically manufacture their products with their name, their branding, their logos, their everything. Um, but we, we manufacture it here. We package it here. And then, uh, and then if they need us to do 3PL, third-party logistics for them, uh, we can also do that here. And so basically we're a, you know, kind of a turnkey solution for, for brands to allow them to focus on what they're good at, which is, you know, the sales and the marketing uh, aspect of, of the brand and getting it out into their customers' hands. And we really take a lot of that back-end infrastructure and back-end business management off of the brand's hands. And we handle all of that. So everything from inventory management to forecasting to supply chain in China and bringing hardware and packaging over um, to the actual, you know, hands-on manufacturing of the products in-house, whether we're filling vapes or cooking brownies or, you know, manufacturing gummies, um, you know, we have all, all of the manufacturing and packaging lines that we've built out here. 
to, to be able to offer this solution to these various brands uh, and, distri and distributors are looking to, you know, kind of launch their in-house brands as well. Um, and so that's what we do. So we, uh, we're, we're, a, we're a full turnkey solution, you know, uh, we manufacture products, but we also handle a lot of that backend management. Like I said, you know, we're, we're, we're on SAP business one. And so that allows for us to really, really give at, you know, in-depth, accurate reporting, inventory management, you know, forecasting, uh, out to our brands so that we can, uh, be, be ahead of the curve and, and make sure that, uh, you know, that we're, we're getting a good product out on time and, and not, not sitting on too much inventory at any point in time. It sounds like your real estate experience is coming into play a little bit here, like logistics and how to manage and how to process and how to, I, I bet a lot of that background in dealing with the real estate probably helped out with this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were, you know, we were managing construction crews in four States, um, you know, doing, yeah, like 50 properties per state per right. month. So, you know, having, having that, having the proper softwares and tools in place to be able to put business systems in place to help you manage that and have visibility into all that, mm -hmm. uh, is, it has certainly helped us a lot here, uh, as well. Cause there's certain, you know, as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts. We do about a million units a month here, uh, of various product SKUs. And so there's, there's, like I said, a lot of moving parts. So, you know, being able to have the uh, the proper tool systems and, and and software in place to be able to manage all that is 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 paramount, um, and obviously our team as well is, uh, is second to none. So, so, so we got what trends are you currently seeing in the in the product side? Since you kind of see a, a pretty wide variety of things happening, um, any any areas that may be growing and or maybe lagging a little bit uh, because you, all this stuff started coming out right away. And it was a little bit overwhelming for those of us that weren't quite as familiar with the industry. Um, right. Yeah. So what's kind of going on now, as far as you can tell, is it, is it kind yeah. of to be a growing industry in certain areas? And uh, I mean, I've heard a lot of people selling CBD oil. I mean, I, you know, no, no number of people that like these multi-level market, all kinds of places selling it, right. It's just everywhere. Seems yeah. Like. So CBD is everywhere. You know, I'd say it's a, it's a, it's a growing segment. Delta eight is obviously a growing segment. Um, you know, just as as new things emerge in the plant, you know, there, there's hundreds of cannabinoids in the plant. Delta eight is okay. one, CBD is one. Uh, there's okay. CBD, there's CBN, which is good for sleep. There's THCV, which is an appetite suppressant, right? And so, so you have all these different cannabinoids that are inside of the hemp plant, and and people are doing as more money comes into the space, more research and development can be performed and figure out what does this cannabinoid do for you know this person, you know this particular uh, you know, person, right. Every, every person has an endocannabinoid system and will receive a certain cannabinoid a little bit differently. Right. And so as more R and D happens, you know, we're, we're developing more products and, and, and more, more, more use cases for, for the plant. Right. Um, you know, product segments that we're seeing go up is, you know, you kind of have a global, not a global, but I'd say a national shift of, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the younger generations, a lot of them are moving away from alcohol drinking and people are looking for other, other, you know, things to do besides alcohol. They don't want to drink alcohol and get wasted and be hung over. And so you're kind of seeing a big shift towards people looking for other things to drink. And so we're seeing the seltzer space, um, you know, really, really start to, to grow. And, you know, we, we, we believe that, you know, there's going to be a massive shift into seltzers, um, you know, with, with some of the bigger spirits brands and companies getting behind it. Um, you know, already you have uh, Pepsi who's purchased a, a rock star version um, of, a, of a hemp seed and a hemp oil um, in one of their rock star plants. And so they're kind of, you know, we're seeing the bigger, you know, Fortune 1000 food and beverage companies get positioned. Um, to make a big play once it becomes, you know, once FDA makes a ruling on it, essentially, or it becomes federally legal, one or the other. And so, you know, everyone's kind of sitting on the sidelines. They can't necessarily get get in right now just because there's too much risk with it. But, um, you know, as soon as FDA says it's safe or it becomes, you know, cannabis becomes federally legal, then then you're going to see, you know, every every probably every food and beverage company jump into the space in some in some way, shape or form. And utilize this as an ingredient, just like any other ingredient that's currently out there and available. Yeah, also they're like expecting like the cigarette companies to jump on board. They're like they're staying away from it until it becomes legal. But all of a sudden, a lot of these smaller companies are gonna be in trouble because all of a sudden you get the big manufacturing plants. They they turn a switch and they can yep. come up with a new product tomorrow afternoon, and 
just flood the market <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on yeah. economy of scale. Uh, now you mentioned like people seem to be shifting from alcohol to hemp a little bit as far as the younger generation. So what are the, what do you think are some of the reasons, like the differences between the two? I mean, most people are familiar with alcohol, but not as many with hemp. So as far as the effects and the down and the ups, you know, there's a down, there's pluses and minuses to any kind of material yeah. like this. So what do you of think course. is why they're doing this? What, do you, what are you hearing? You know, I think it's just a, you're, you're kind of seeing a shift more towards health and wellness. You got, you know, a lot, even like the mushroom elixir drinks that are coming out now. Right. And that, you know, you'll have a lot of the adaptogens uh, that, you know, adaptogens drinks that are coming out. And so I think people are just looking for an alternative. They want something that still kind of relaxes you a little bit. Um, you know, it gets you a little social Delta eight's a cool, a cool thing that, you know, you can still, you know, socialize with it. Whereas usually Delta nine, if you, you know, if you, if anybody's, you know, tried Delta nine and gone out in a social environment, most people don't want to be social if they get really high. <laughs> so right. Delta eight is, is more of just a relaxing, you know, it, it, it allows you to still kind of interact and, and be social. And, uh, and I think that's, that's why it's, it's gaining a lot of popularity, uh, just cause it's not so strong and you can, you know, you still get a little relaxing aspect from it, but it, you know, it doesn't totally knock you out and want to, you know, want, want you to just kind of lay on the couch and watch TV and, and eat snacks. Right. Right. <laughs> typical, uh, right. The, you still the, have the, 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 your special brownies in your menu. It you might, might not work as well. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So what other, so you see that happening. Um, any other products that are popular? I mean, I hear the, the gummies and the, and the, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the look, gummies are extremely popular. Um, you know, people always love gummies to, you know, people love vit vitamins in their gummies, right. They just, they're easy right. to eat. They taste good. And, uh, you know, and if you can get an effect from it, that, that that's all the better. And so, so gummies are certainly, uh, certainly a, a huge seller right now. Vapes is also a very huge seller. People like to vape. Um, and so you're seeing the, the vape, which is a massive seller, um, as well. And, you know, we think, you know, kind of Q1, Q2 of next year, we're going to, you know, there may be a, a change in regulation, um, which will, which will limit the, the serving sizes or the amount of, uh, milligrams per serving. And should that happen, we're, we're kind of forecasting that baked goods is going to be a big, a big mover. And baked goods is, you know, cause nobody wants to eat a big old gummy. Right. But you know, some people right. are, people, people are okay eating a big cookie, uh, but nobody wants yeah. to eat a big gummy. It's just too much gummy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we okay. think baked goods will probably take over because you'll have to make a bigger gummy in order to put the, the amount of milligrams into, into that gummy in order to feel, or into that baked good in order oh, to so it's feel based like on that. the density of the product, not necessarily density. about per, per yeah. serving quote unquote, whatever that means. Yeah, exactly. Well, every again, every state is different, and, and each states are kind of taking a different a uh, different approach on that. Uh, but you know, for the most part, uh, you know that that's a lot of the states are taking, uh, you know, like, like a percentage to to how big, how, how many grams the. Uh, the I'm wondering how it's going to work. I remember when New York State, their New York City, I think, limited the size of a soda. And then, you know, the no, people I don't just, remember that. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they, they, well, I forget what it was. I, you know, uh, I, I forget which mayor it was, but he, he goes, well, we're, we're getting too heavy in New York. So we're not going to allow the 32 ounce soda. You can only get like, a, I think it was a 12 ounce soda. Oh, wow. Everybody got real. I think it lasted a few months and everybody got yeah, livid. Everybody it's revolted, like, huh? Yeah. It's like, well, I'm just going to keep filling it up. I'm going to drink my 32 ounces. If I want to drink my 32 ounces. It was kind of, it was kind of an interesting, like social experiment in my view, the way it worked is like, well, if you, if you, I'm not sure if that kind of a philosophy works um, with people, frankly. So I just thought I find it interesting they're doing it again in another industry. Um, if that's their, I don't know how we're, I don't know how it's going to work. It just sounds interesting to me. Um, I, I guess maybe it's like alcohol content. We don't want the, to be above a certain amount of percentage of alcohol. Maybe that's the idea. Right. Um, yeah. But, well, look, I mean, anytime but, the government tries to come in and outlaw something, it's you know you're always going to have the 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 prohibition in alcohol, right? right. And, you know, I think marijuana. You know, most states right now, I think, you know, the legal aspect is about half. The you know the the, the black market is still about half. I mean, right. You know, look at states like California, and there's still a huge, huge black market in you know in the marijuana sector, and so right. you know the, it's just I mean that's just kind of how how it goes. So I mean, obviously, we're pushing for federal legalization, and we we think it would be it'd be great for that to happen, and um, you know, and then just have a framework that everybody can 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 work from. And that's, that's, you know, ideally what would happen eventually, but it's just not there yet. So. Okay. so. All right. We're going to take another quick break. You're listening to master your finances. Welcome back. You're listening to master your finance. I'm here with Ryan McFarland and uh, we're talking a lot about like some of the things that are happening on a state and a federal level. Um, a lot of the, the basically consumable products that are out there now 
Um, so what do you see happening moving forward with the industry as, as a lot of these things, at some point, they'll probably, most likely, most people think that are actually being logical about this, it will become legal on a federal level at some point, because I think it's just a matter of time, because of all this, the way the states seem to be shifting at some point, well, it actually is legal on federal level, I'm sorry, the states will start, they'll line up better, right? Over time, these conflicts will start to become more clear, and the industry, I think, is going to get more uh clarity and like how they can grow. So as you see that happening, where do you, where do you see it headed? Yeah. So look, I mean, you know, hemp is, is, is in my, in my mind, you know, is close to one of the cure-all plants for, for the environment and, uh, and just the world in general. So it helps with, you know, not only, you not only have all the, the medical side that we've kind of discussed previously, you have the, the next, next is the industrial side and, right. and hemp is, uh, you know, an amazing plant. Obviously, all plants have the ability to sequester carbon uh, from the air, but industrial hemp, you know, probably is one of the best because it can suck up twice as much carbon as like a typical forest tree, right? But you can grow a hemp plant in, you know, three or four months instead of a tree taking a bunch, you know, three, five, 10 years, right. um, you know, so and and, you know, a hectare of hemp can absorb around eight to 15 tons of CO2, whereas a forest can capture about two to six tons. So it's not only pulling more CO2 out of the air, you can grow it quicker. And then when you harvest the hemp, you can cut it down in three or four months once it's ready to be harvested. And you know the top you can take and use that for the medical side, all the cannabinoids can be extracted out of that. And then you can take the, the rest of the plant and utilize it for textiles, hemp textiles to make clothing. You can utilize it for hempcrete to make concrete, which is stronger than normal concrete. Uh, you can utilize it to make hemp wood, uh, hemp plastics. And so, you know, this one plant can, you know, has all the medical benefits associated with it that we've discussed, uh, the relaxation benefits that we've discussed, but all the industrial side as well. And there's carbon credits available, right? And so, you know, the carbon credits are available for farmers growing hemp um, and a lot of the bigger companies that, you know, are trying to get to a carbon neutral standpoint uh, will purchase these carbon credits. And so, so that, you know, kind of is another profit center available to, you know, to, to you know, farmers that are looking to do this on a, on a large scale. And, um, and so that's what we're getting involved with. We, you know, there's 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 some federal grants through the USDA that have been uh, provided out uh, last year, and we're working with a couple of the companies that that uh, you know were successful in in, in getting those grants um, to really build out this program and make a proof of concept for you know for hemp itself and you know the carbon aspects and and the industrial side um, as well. And so that's so, you know super super exciting, and and I think ultimately is, 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 you know, the, 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 the medical and the, the cannabinoid side of hemp is, is, you know, going to be peanuts compared to what is going to be happening and what can be done with the industrial side. Once the efficiencies come into line and, and, you know, hemp is treated as a, as a commodity, right. Which is what it is. It's a big agricultural commodity. Um, and, you know, eventually there'll be factories and facilities that'll be able to, uh, you know, grow thousands and thousands of acres of hemp, you know, process it down, you know, pull the, pull the cannabinoids off, take the rest of it into, you know, hemp fiber or textiles, um, or, or be able to then, you know, further process it into, into the, you know, what, what you need to process it to start making hemp crete, hemp wood and hemp plastics. And so that's really, really, really exciting. And that's something we're, we're paying very close attention to and starting to, uh, starting to get, get in line so that we can, uh, participate in, uh, in the industrial side of hemp. So, so what, what do you think has held back the industrial side so far? Cause I mean, I've heard some of the things you just mentioned as far as the other ways that this can be used, that it's mm -hmm. actually a pretty strong material. It can be used in a lot of different ways. Why don't you think we're using it more now? Um, is it that the other items, I mean, sort of like the, I guess the electric car, right? Is the gas you know, ice engine still cheaper than the, you know, the electric car maybe to overall cost. Is there some economic reason or is it a production reason or is it a it's, is it a legal it really reason comes down to the processing facilities you know it's 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 easy to grow hemp right and like you, you can right. grow hemp and hemp is a great plant it's a rotational crop as well so you know you can't grow corn on the same on the same land you know right after right after each other you gotta you gotta either let it sit and get nutrients back in it or you can put a plant like hemp in it hemp sucks all the 
all the bad stuff out of the ground and puts all the good stuff back in it. And so wow. it's a really good rotational crop for these big agricultural farmers to be able to utilize. And uh, but the but, but the issue is being able to process it and then have it like we like we said before, right? You can grow you know tens of millions of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds of hemp. But if there's no buyer for it at the end of the day, it just sits and rots and it turns into, you know, trash, right? And so that's that's the issue is there's no processing or not enough processing facilities that are able to process the hemp and get it into a final product like hemp crete, hemp wood, or hemp plastics or textiles to make clothing um, at a, you know, at a number that makes economical sense to where you're going to, you know, demand a, a big market share of let's say plastics or you know wood or concrete and so so that's kind of what we're waiting for is you know maybe the government will be able to subsidize some of that and help some of these facilities get up and running uh or maybe they'll reward companies for purchasing this type of product because you know because of the the aspects and how it's going to help the environment um but you know to, to date there's nothing you know that's 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 been developed uh to allow for these these manufacturing facilities to to get the product into a into a state that it can be purchased you know at a reasonable uh number and uh and so that's going to take time you know but uh but as as everything does <laughs> so right so. so it really has to do with the processing and getting into that form that actually makes economic sense so right now I mean, if I want to buy a shirt, it's it's probably better to buy a cotton shirt than a hemp shirt. It sounds like from a financial standpoint, is that from a kind financial of standpoint? Yeah, that is correct. And so, you know, that's 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 what we're waiting for. And it's and that goes for you know the plastics, the wood, and the you know the, the textiles and and everything else. So, so, so you think this is an economy of scale, or is it the actual process? Of, like, if I had a plant big enough, like if I'm like uh, if I'm Elon Musk and I make a a giga factory for uh, processing for the plants. Um, is, is it just a matter of getting a high enough scale or are they still not quite figured out the process? Uh, maybe they're doing it in a lab kind of deal almost. Is that yeah, what? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the process is like. there, you know, it's, right. it, it's, it's, it's certainly there. It's just, you know, then it's, yeah, if you made a gigafactory in your musk, you know, I'd, I'd say you're, you're going to figure it out. It's, you'll be able to produce a, a, a bunch of product, but then it's going to be, you know, bringing the buyers in that are going to take that off your hands. So it's, you know, it's the entire right. supply chain, right? So it's, it's, yeah, you can grow the hemp. Yeah, you can process it if you had the big enough facility. But now it's you know customer adoption, and you know, and, and what's that timeline going to take, and 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 why are customers going to adopt it, right? And ideally, you know, the the we can get some sort of government incentive or or, or program in place that that rewards these companies for for buying this type of product because of the you know of just all the benefits that come along with it. From the carbon aspects to the soil aspects to you know it's it's biodegradable <laughs> you know right. it's not going to sit in our oceans for you know 20 years before it uh before it you know so biodegrades they plastic years. bottles for the seltzer you talked about before What's that yeah exactly i mean that's that's the bottle that's, out of hemp as well as the seltzer uh, water so just yeah. like the other question do, do you see anything happening overseas it might be uh, a little ahead of us as far as any of this process goes the industrialization because um, i have seen like hemp clothing being sold and oh, so yeah, it yeah, exists, yeah. right? Um, so it is out there. It exists. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, China is, 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 is massive in the industrial side. So I think the, you know, the industrial hemp uh, cultivation uh, and manufacturing is, is, is happening in China. Uh, you're seeing a lot of big ag and, you know, I mean, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of acres are being utilized for industrial hemp growth. Um, and so they, they're definitely, you know, growing it for the industrial aspects. Um, and they're going to be, you know, as, as China is, you know, they make all, all kinds of different products. So, so yeah, I mean, you, you have a lot of the countries that are starting to adopt hemp's industrial aspect, um, and, and utilize it for that. So, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see where it goes, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, not so up to date on uh, on the worldwide aspect of hemp cultivation and, and where it's all at. I'm more more so focused on the U.S. right now, but it, it is it is out there. And yeah, hundred percent. There's there's other countries that are that are utilizing it, and and, and we'll see where they go with it. But uh, but but hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll we'll, we'll be the leader. Yeah. So you guys are sounding like you're positioning yourself. You you don't think this is going to have the same like after they legalize it on the federal level, the the industrial side will probably be a little different. Like it'll be a growth thing, like a 
as things get more uh, efficient, then you'll part, probably start to see the products introduced over, you know, through certain specialties, like maybe, I don't know, this all, you know, iPhone cases or something, you know, that are made out of hemp plastic or something. There may be some niche yeah. things to no, start with. Like, you'll, you'll up. Certain yeah. product segments. I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about, you know, you know, putting single use plastics out uh, made from hemp. So, you know, and, and, right. and distributing those to like the fast food restaurants, right? So straws. Yeah, yeah or, like a straw, a hemp food, straw might be nice, right? You know, <laughs> knives, things like that. Right. You know, all these single use plastics that just, you know, sit in the landfill and they get used once and then they, you know, go into the ocean in a lot of these places, you know, if we can utilize hemp to create that, uh, you know, that that's going to, you know, be biodegradable, that's obviously going to be something that's going to be a big benefit for, uh, for our environment. And, um, you know, something, something I'm, I'm passionate about and that we're moving forward uh, here on, on putting together and, you know, starting to do R and D with product development, things like that. So, right. and this has been awesome. Any like final thoughts before we uh, sign off today? No, no, just, you know, any, anybody that's listening to this, if you want to uh, connect, you can just get me uh, on, on LinkedIn or, um, you know, at our website, uh, wareshemp.com. And uh, our other uh, website is whbiopharma.com. And uh, it's been great, great on the show. And thank you so much for for having me and inviting me on and uh, and, and chatting about, uh, about the hemp industry. It's been great. Right. So thanks again. Well, thanks again, Ryan. Well, everybody, you've been listening to Master Your Finance. Don't forget to uh, subscribe at masteryourfinances.us. Thanks again.